Good morning. I'm Julio Sainz, along with Mauricio Riveros. Today, we'll meet Alex Castro, the CEO of Pastor Incorporation, who was once a client of the organization, and hear about his unique path to success. We hope you will be inspired. Celebrating leaders in Rochester's unique and vibrant business community, we'll meet entrepreneurs whose passion and perseverance have helped push through life's challenges. Join us as we share their stories and journeys to success. It's time to be inspired. Alex, thank you very much for being Be Inspired, a show that we developed to interview entrepreneurs, interesting people like you. You are one of the top 100 in Rochester leaders. Uh, congratulations for that appointment and congratulations for your relatively recent appointment as a CEO of Badstone, a great organization, an important, uh, incredible serving organization in our community. So let's start talking a little bit about who is Alex Castro. Oh, well, thank you, Mauricio. Julio, uh, nice to be on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. It's exciting. I know both of you, and uh, uh, it's always a great opportunity when we can have uh, this type of conversation. Uh, well, Mauricio, that, that's a very broad question. Uh, you know, uh, I, I am just an individual that through the years have been fortunate to land in Rochester and be adopted by this great community and have been able to somehow through uh, getting to know people like yourself and a lot of the folks in the network have been exposed to many opportunities. Uh, and now here I am fortunately running past on as a CEO, but all as a result of uh, friendships, network and investing in the community. In, in fact, investing in a community that also invested in me. So you know, I'm very happy to be here. Well, you are really an inspiration for our community and I love, so you Tell us a little bit, you have been born in Puerto Rico and came to Rochester. So tell us a little bit about your personal story. You have born here. I don't know that portion of your history. So if you can tell us a little bit about that. All right. Uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, when I was uh, 19 years old, I moved to Florida. Uh, and then from Florida, I moved to Rochester. I moved here. Uh, I had no family and friends here. I just, I just came. Uh, I, I, at that point, I had met someone in Florida who was uh, originally from Rochester, moved here uh, and, you know, made my life here. No friends. I, if I remember correctly, it was just a bag of clothes and a few dollars in my pocket and just starting, you know, someone starting a new life. And uh, through that, got the opportunity again to meet a lot of great folks and individuals who created and opened a lot of doors for me. So from there, starting going to school, you know, one of, one of the biggest jokes uh, in my family and, you know, is, is, is in, in all in good is, you know, it took me about 12 years to finish, uh, uh, you know, from associates to bachelor's to master's degree. So it was, you know, little by little, again, a lot of work, uh, but with a lot of support. Alex, as a matter of fact, I, I did what, it's funny you mentioned that because that's one of the things I was going to ask you uh, about, you know, um, when I, when I met you, you know, you were just starting to work on your associates and, you know, you're balancing family and working full time and everything. And you ended up getting a master's from uh, the Simon School, your MBA from Simon School. Um, what advice would you give people who are watching this, who are trying to do the same thing, trying to balance a family and work full time and go to school and feeling like it's going to take 12, 15 years? How do I stick with this? What advice would you give people? Well, I, I'll probably give the advice, you know, throughout that time, I'm not going to say that I had a clear goal and I really uh, wanted to do it. I mean, I, I was discouraged constantly on the amount of time that it was taking. But, uh, you know, my mother uh, said, listen, you know, the one thing you cannot control is time. Five, 10 years are going to go by anyways. So when those five or 10 years go by, do you want to say uh, that you have something under your, you know, that you have accomplished something or, or are you still going to be saying that it's going to take too long, right? So the first thing is just a lot of patience. It just takes an incredible amount of patience. You, you know, re you really got to want it. Uh, and to be honest, I was inspired by the friends that I had around me who had all those accomplishments already under their belt. Uh, and I said, hey, listen, if I'm hanging out with these folks and spending time with them and, and they've done it, that means that I can do it. Uh, you know, they took the traditional route. That doesn't mean that I have to take the traditional route. So let me just take the, the longer route. Cause at that point, that's all I could do. As I said, Julio, working full time and having a family was very difficult to go to school full time. So it's just a matter of, you know, taking bite sizes. 
every year you get a you know every six months every semester you get a step closer and and once you get the ball rolling uh, you start seeing oh okay I, i'm halfway there now so uh, again just a lot of patience well that's wonderful and and congratulations alex because you have accomplished uh, so many things in your career and your life and now you are in Pat Stone and, you know, for many years. And so tell us a little bit about Pat Stone. What's the vision and where Pat Stone is going? Yeah, what, what, if I'm allowed, you know, I'll mix in uh, the mission of Pat Stone, but as well, I give a, a life sample of, of what Pat Stone accomplishes. So Pat Stone, uh, overall mission is help families with self-sufficiency, meaning these are families that perhaps are going through some difficulties and they just need, need, need perhaps some temporary assistance. Uh, sometimes we offer long-term assistance such as our senior housing, uh, but we provide training and employment and affordable housing. The interesting part of all this is, you know, as Julio mentioned, how was I able to at some point, you know, have a family full-time job and also go to school? The interesting part, and I just found this out about, you know, just five years ago when I started at Pastone, is that I was uh, low income I had the ability to move into a low income apartment, which then allowed me to, instead of working two jobs, allowed me to work only one job. And then instead of the second job, then I was able to go to school. And the, the irony, the good irony of all this is that that building was actually owned by Pastone, which is now the organization that I'm the CEO of. So uh, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it shows why organizations like Pastone exist. So Alex, I think Pastone is one of those uh, hidden gems in Rochester that a lot of people don't understand just how big and impactful they are. Can you tell us a little bit about where where you guys work, where you know around the country, and a little bit about everything that you do? Yeah, so uh, Pastone is a 51 year old organization, headquartered here in Rochester, New York, but we have services in seven states and Puerto Rico. We have 12 different line of businesses with about 600 employees. Uh, we're known in Rochester for housing, uh, but in Pennsylvania, for example, we run a, a large Head Start program. We also do small business lending. Uh, we do training and employment in Puerto Rico. Uh, we develop and manage affordable housing. So, you know, depending on where we are, people know us for different things, but we're mostly known here in Rochester because this is where our headquarters is. Uh, for uh, our housing, our involvement in housing and uh, development, management of, of affordable housing. Can, can you tell us a couple of your major projects here in the area now that people would know? Yeah, actually, one of the exciting projects is I think we are either the first or one of the first developers of affordable housing in, uh, in a dilapidated mall. In Aranda Quaid Mall, for example, we are now developing senior housing in the all around the Quaid Mall and the Sears store. Uh, so now it's called, it's called Skyview Apartments and it's gonna be a senior, uh, an apartment for senior development. And we did a little bit different, you know, instead of just taking the box and keep it as a box, we actually opened up the middle of the store. So it's all kind of like a courtyard uh, exposed, you know, from the ground up with three different uh, little courtyards and little plazas inside. So uh, again, that that's the excitement of the organization is that uh, it hasn't been done before, so we said, let's take a chance and let's do it. We also had a, another great development uh, at, uh, at Kodak uh, Park. There was a parking lot in between uh, Dewey and Ridge Road, uh, vacant lot, and there we were able to develop somewhat of a contained community uh, with single homes, apartments, and townhomes. Uh, so again, that, that's, those are two completely different developments. Uh, but it shows, you know, uh, our ability to adapt to what is needed in the community that we're developing. So, Alex, um, you know, very important topic, uh, affordable housing and the deficit of housing right now. And it's very interesting to see. I have been talking with some people that we still struggle with in terms of providing high housing for people who are in uh, need. Uh, so what's your take on that? You have a lot of experience and how do you see the evolution of affordable housing in, in the state of New York? Well, uh, you know, first I'll take a step back and I think it's unfortunate that we need to have an affordable housing conversation. Uh, but, you know, here we are having it. Uh, so, yeah, so th there is a significant need. I mean, anytime we have a new development, the, the, the waiting lists are just extraordinary. 
So uh, obviously the demand for our, for affordable housing is, is still significant. It, there is not enough supply. So that says a lot about our ability to uh, have low income and, and middle income individuals actually participate economically uh, in the larger economy uh, when there's still that need. So yes, it is a challenge. Uh, we're always looking for opportunities of developing in high opportunity areas. And what I mean by that is these are areas that, that may, perhaps may have better uh, choices of school, employment, transportation. Uh, so those kids that are growing then in those households, perhaps in the future may not need affordable housing. And that's where the self-sufficiency comes in. It may be a little bit tougher for this generation, but if we can provide those services, perhaps the next generation may not need of those services. So again, we're, we're always talking with uh, national developers of affordable housing and the challenges that there are when it comes to developing uh, affordable housing. Well, thank you, Alex. We'll be back with more after these messages. Well, you talk about the mission of the organization and you know, we talk on this show often with owners about trying to find people that can have that same passion. Uh, how do you how do you do that in trying to find employees, other leaders in your organization that can have that same passion to the mission of the organization? Well, uh, uh, you know, his, a lot of our employees, and you know, I can definitely, I will not take credit for this. We have employees that have been with us for 20, 30, 30 45 years. So uh, a lot of that is something that I was lucky enough to adopt it. So I was looking back at how were we able to maintain those folks and attract those folks, right? One of the challenges that we have is we have a new generation, a new workforce, and that new workforce is really looking for different opportunities that that other generation. They're looking for flexibility. They're working. They're looking for remote work. They're really emphasizing work and life balance, right? So how do you shift your organization to make sure that you provide that to the new workforce, but you still need to attract those folks that are really are in it for the mission. Yeah, and that's the fine art, right? Is be able to engage different generations, especially in a transition time where we are, where a lot of the uh, baby boomers are in the retirement stage and the next generation is coming, but then we have the next generation coming and getting ready to get involved in the workforce. Rochester, New York, you have, you know, in Best Leap, you know, your headquarters are in Rochester. What do you see the Rochester economy and what's your perspective about Rochester specifically? Uh, well, you know, we have been facing some significant challenges. Unfortunately, when you talk about Rochester, there's the unfortunate always conversation of the city versus the suburbs, which to me has always been, you know, a significant conversation being that we are really somewhat of a small community, right? So unless we start having that larger conversation, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the entire region to, uh, uh, to pull forward. Uh, there are other cities, other communities that uh, you know, got a clue about this early on and, and, and are acting on it. So until we come together as a community and we look at ourselves as a region rather than individual uh, municipalities or towns, I think it's, it's going to be a significant challenge for us to, uh, to tackle. So it, it's, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, your group of friends and everything uh, and how that um, helped you as you were get, going through school and sort of seeing the path forward, did you have any um, mentors? Uh, you know what, not officially. I had some great supervisors. Uh, one of the best mentor supervisors was uh, Ann Peterson. She was the executive director of the housing council. Uh, you know, I learned by working with her through many years. Uh, she was excellent. Uh, so, you know, I have, you know, borrow a lot of her style in managing and, and, you know, she made it very clear that for a minority person, much like for a woman, uh, you have to take certain different steps that, that otherwise you would not take, uh, in order to be successful. So, uh, she had, she had definitely a significant impact on me, uh, now replacing Stuart Mitchell at Pastone, uh, he had, was the CEO for close to 50 years of the organization. So he must be, he must have been doing something right, correct? Uh, and it's just that importance of, you know, we, we often get too worried and overburdened with the financial situations, uh, with the strategy. And, it, it, you know, it, it always helps to understand why is it that we're here? We always got to look at the people that we're helping 
that's the main reason why we're here. So we have to make sure that we do that. So that's one of the biggest things that I have drawn from him, which is always keep the mission first. Always keep the mission first and always keep the people that we serve. Uh, this is what we're doing, what we're doing. One of the beauty of living in Rochester is that we have a very giving community, community who gives a lot. We have great organizations. There is a lot of partnerships that are happening through United Way and other uh, not-for-profit organizations. What is the level of involvement of Pat Stone in the giving back to community and the efforts to community involvement in general? One, one of the main, I mean, as a nonprofit organization, obviously our main goal is uh, the revenue that we receive either through fundraising grants or activities that, that generate unrestricted funds uh, is to provide the services to our clients. But we still have an obligation to the community. So one of the things that we do is encourage our staff to get involved. And that's perhaps in other nonprofit organizations or other companies. So one of the things that we offer our staff is the ability to serve on boards that have absolutely nothing to do with what Paston does, right? So it's either through, through the school, through other nonprofit organizations that are completely unrelated. So we, we see that uh, as part of our mission to also provide the opportunity for staff to get involved in things that they're passionate about outside of past on, but do it within the past on context, meaning we provide that, that support for them. So you do, uh, you manage a lot. We've talked about how in different times you've also managed even more. Uh, well, probably around the same in terms of workload. What are some tips uh, that you would give people to stay organized? Start with the end goal in mind and then develop, you know, uh, small plans to get there. And then those small plans, develop smaller plans to get to those small plans and uh, patience, an incredible amount of sense of humor and have short-term memory for failures. What I mean by that is most likely you're gonna fail more than you succeed. Just make sure that your successes are bigger than your failures, but don't get discouraged by failures. And I've always said, one of my favorite things is, uh, you know, every, every tragedy, uh, there's an opportunity in every tragedy. So if you really start looking at bad things as opportunities, all of a sudden you start realizing that you, know, you, you, you become more positive and you're less afraid of failing because you know you're gonna learn. Therefore you can take bigger risks and that's how you learn and that's how you move forward. And you know, once you achieve something, celebrate it, but then immediately, you know, the day after ask, what's next? Love it, I love it. And I think that tells a lot about who you are, Alex. And one of the things that I saw and, and observe a lot is talking about the next generation is this balance, but how you inject in the next generation that, that really passion for work, you know, it's a, and, and again, every, every generation has a strength and every generation has an opportunity. But one of the biggest challenges right now is, especially with COVID and people working at homes, is how you get that passion, that flavor of like, you know, the things that I remember when I started, like I can spend 12, 15 hours. A day. That was this balance. That was crazy. I don't recommend that. But my question is how we, you know, how we create the, the, it's kind of an imbalance right now. So how can we lift a little bit the element of passion and injection of passion for, for jobs in the next generation, especially that right now, a lot of the long distance work and, and the Zooms and all these things that we are experiencing, how we re-engage our workforce and especially the next generation. Yeah, for, for us is, you know, we, we do a lot during our interview to ensure that folks are really passionate about what we're doing. But once we hire the person, we need, we understand and we invest a significant amount of our energy, making sure that in order for people to be passionate about what they do, uh, they need to be happy employees. Uh, they need to know that their families are taken care of. They need to know that the employment is taken care of. They, they need to know that the employer is actually uh, looking out for them. So once you start taking a lot of those worries that usually stress us out, and then at the same time, insert the ability to, hey, we're doing all this. And because we're doing all this, you're less concerned. And because you're less concerned, look at the work you're doing. So there's some internal marketing that takes place with all of the achievement that we accomplish. If, if we just make this a job, uh, then that's all it is, a job, right? But, you know, it takes a lot of energy to market 
to ourselves the great work that we're doing and how do we impact the communities around us, right? Uh, so when we, when we have, you know, those, these, those 600 staff are in 80, I think it's about 77 to 80 different offices throughout. So how do you do that locally, right? So you have to implement some kind of infrastructure that celebrates those, those successes. And, and that way it becomes less of a job. And, you know, is you, often I say that's part of the compensation package, right? Which is, the, the, you, you know, the passion that you get into the job and how does that translate to bettering the community that each of us live and each of our 600 employees live. Wow. Really, Alex, it's very impressive. Uh, congratulations again for what you are doing with your organization. And congratulations to be part of this community for many years, uh, involved in many things. Uh, Rochester people need, needs people like you. And send, so thank you for serving our community. And I'm sure that we will have you in the future in another program to see the progress that you're having uh, through your organization and through your professional career. So thank you again for being in this fight today. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Hugo. Coming up next week, we'll meet James Sinal, president of NextCore, a business incubator that's helping over 200 new companies in Rochester get off on the right start. To watch today's episode and the complete interviews of our guests, go to rochesterfirst.com slash be inspired. For more great talk with Rochester's entrepreneurs, listen to Bodet 97.1, Saturdays at 9 a.m. For Mauricio Riveros, I'm Julio Sainz. We'll see you next week on Be Inspired.